all of you here. Uh, my name is Afshin Yurdakul, and I'll be moderating this debate. Um, we will be talking about how to achieve sustainable development goals. Tough question indeed, which is why we're bringing together experts and also local actors who are um, trying to find solutions in their own cities. Um, and we have a great uh, panel here uh, with me this morning, and they will be sharing their own experiences. Um, we'll have one guiding question this morning, which is how can local creativity and global knowledge be deployed to achieve these goals <coughs> and make an impact across the globe? Um, those will be the questions that we will be, that we'll be looking at. Um, obviously, we'll be exploring how to achieve these goals, their challenges and their ideas, um, and uh, but we will be exploring them all and that various stakeholders, what role can they play um, in that direction. And um, I have to say, in the spirit of this discussion, we'll make it a real global conversation um, because we'll have uh, global shaper hubs, cities who are also joining um, the debate. They will be bringing their own insight um, to, to our discussion here um, at Davos. So I'm joined by fantastic panelists here, and I'd like to take the opportunity to, um, to, to introduce them. Um, William Warshower, President and Chief Executive Officer of TechnoServe, and, um, and Gonzalo Munoz, co-founder and chief executive officer of Triciclos in Brazil. And we'll have uh, different cities joining us um, uh, who are an important part of this discussion. Four cities, um, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, Chandigarh, and Rabat. Um, and I would like to introduce our uh, panelists there as well. Amr Al Madani, Executive Director of Mishkat at King Abdullah City for Atomic and Renewable Energy. Venkat Maturi, Senior Director of Strategy, JA Worldwide's India Enterprise Impact Initiative. Sonia Mazur, Secretary General, Nas National Agency for the Development of Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency. Um, and we will have Tony Lee Luen Len, founding chairperson of the Green Building Council of Mauritius. So thank you all for being here. And um, I should also remind you that our audience here, but there's also a global audience um, watching us and who will be contributing to this debate. Our hashtag is Shape Sustainability. And uh, please join in the conversation and send us your thoughts and questions. Without further ado, I'll turn to my panelists um, and let's, let's uh, start with you, William. Please tell us, what challenges um, can we talk about and can we explore um, in terms of achieving, achieving these goals? Well, I think from a global perspective, uh, it's first worth celebrating that uh, the dramatic decline in poverty rates around the world we've seen over the last 20 years and in recognizing that that has been driven primarily through economic development in India and in China. Uh, the organization I lead, TechnoServe, has been committed for almost 50 years to finding business solutions to poverty. And what we see again at a global level is that for every dollar of official aid money to uh, foster development, there is, depending on whose numbers you believe, five to seven dollars of foreign investment. And so the, the, the trick now is to think how do you leverage this massive and growing business investment to be inclusive and to drive sustainable growth. And the good news is that the, uh, some of the leading multinational companies are thinking about this problem quite differently than they did even a decade ago. And we see more and more areas where the business interest and the social interest line up. So while previously a company that was sourcing from emerging markets would think, well, maybe I can get it 10% cheaper, it's zero sum, I win. Now they understand if the family who's growing what they're buying is, uh, can't uh, come out of poverty, it may not be there for them to buy it next year. They may not meet the quality standards. So there is a business interest that the, the, the small farmer who we work with all over the world uh, can win. And I give you uh, one quick example. Uh, we worked with the Coca-Cola company in East Africa. They're the world's largest juice company. They committed to sourcing all of their fruit to make the juice in Africa from Africa. In Kenya, there were mangoes rotting on the trees, going to waste, being used by no one. And through some simple work with the farmers and helping them organize into businesses, they're now supplying that uh, large supply chain. Uh, I come to Davos directly from South Sudan, where we're working in the Fantastic. southern part of that country with food secure farmers who are growing a beautiful coffee. 
and Nespresso is, for the first time in the history of South Sudan, exporting that coffee and selling it in Europe. The families that are growing it are more than tripling their incomes. It's an enormously encouraging thing. So the possibilities in this moment now around the globe uh, are great. Uh, I, I think technology helps foster that and uh, the ability for a remote farmer at the end of a very long and dusty road to be connected to these global companies and global supply chains is, is unparalleled. Uh, I think we all look in the eye uh, a, a massive global challenge, which I will close with, which is climate change. And mm -hmm. these small farmers around the world uh, are both uh, uh, they're on the front lines of this. Uh, they're, they're, they're most affected. They have the fewest tools in their toolbox to deal with the problem. And so it's a major challenge for, for all of us who work with them around the world. That's great. Ernesto. Great. Thank you. Uh, well, I'll take William's uh, baton to say that uh, from my perspective, uh, we have enough evidence from uh, all of what had happened uh, regarding the global warming and the problems of inequality in the world to say that there's a need of a relevant change and that change must be also led by the business people, business, the business world, right? And uh, there is a huge momentum and, and a huge uh, uh, group of people in the world that is creating companies for profit that are not only uh, willing to create profit, but also they want to create change. So there's no not need anymore to say whether I'm going to create a, a monetary benefit or solve the problems of the world. You can do both. You must do both. I mean, there's a moment for businesses to start rethinking why do, do, do we exist? Is it only for creating shareholder value? Is it uh, that I'm going to keep on creating and maximizing shareholder value and try to use marketing as a way to uh, be, be seen in a better way uh, regarding all of these problems? Or is uh, really a moment for start rethinking why do we create companies and therefore how do I do things at the same time? So there's a huge movement of, of more than uh, 1,500 companies around the world that are uh, certified as B Corps. So, and, and also there are uh, 3,000 benefit corporations in the U.S. There are many uh, uh, countries that are also working on the law to redefine success in business, to, to determine that there is a legal way to create uh, financial benefits, but at the same time do it in a way that will create uh, what we call a durable and shared prosperity. So that's the, the message that I'm bringing here. I think that... Uh, even most of those companies were created and are, are run by probably young people with the spirit of change. Most of those people in the past were be probably more rela related to on uh, NGOs. And in this moment, they're saying, I want to do business with this idea and with, with this passion. But at the same time, very, very big companies are also joining this movement because they understand that that's the way to move. Uh, even that will take a long time to get certified and change the bylaws. Uh, most of them are working, for example, with, with the providers. And so, so many big companies say, okay, th there is a, a model. The Be Impact Assessment is an extraordinary tool. It's open, and I will use it to understand which, uh, which are the, the uh, uh, parameters for my providers and which is the kind of value that they are integrating to my value change. And uh, therefore, they will be integrating the global movement. Do you think time. there are more and more companies interested in this? Or I'm trying to understand um, what to use the challenge here, trying to explain to, um, to, to people in a business world that this is the way this is going. Because you asked a very important question. <coughs> we need to think why these companies exist and right. how they're supposed to proceed. So do you think more people are interested or, or sort of exploring these ideas and thinking out of the box? Is that what you see? I would say there are many reasons why any company in the world should, should move towards this type of business. My, my ideal is about the Bicor movement because, because I, I belong to that and I really believe in that, but I, I understand that in many other uh, places of the world, you can develop different types of legally based triple bottom line businesses, okay, where profit is a consequence, not just the only motivation. Reasons f to do that first, and why to go through the, the certification process as well. Uh, first is a real commitment, so you have to change the bylaws to do so. Uh, while while uh, doing that, you have to be very transparent 
and actually all of the business in the world are being checked by any single uh, stakeholder. And, 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 and people, they, the, the consumers, the customers, they don't really believe in everything that businessmen uh, are telling them, right? And I'm, and I'm saying that I was a former CEO of traditional companies for 10 years and I'm in this side of the business, but I really believe in business. And I understand that marketing is an extraordinary tool but many times it's pointing in the wrong direction. And not only our customers are, are looking at that, our employees are needing our companies to be totally related to their personal values. And, and people will choose not only voting by the dollar, by voting in the way they use their talent. That will be the most powerful vote that people is using in this moment. That's Absolutely. really important. Very quickly, and then we'll go to our... Yeah, I, I just want to add that yeah. even for a traditional uh, corporation, uh, A, they, they needs to be a successful business for that $7 to go in an investment they yeah. need to be earning. But uh, we're seeing this led increasingly from the C-suite inside major multinationals. Uh, uh, their customers, their investors, and certainly their employees, especially their millennials, are demanding clean supply chains, the customers want to know uh, where does this product come from, who's benefited along the way. So there's a business imperative for these sorts of activities now. That's um, great. And um, now let's go to, where should we go to? We have uh, so many interesting cities joining the conversation. Um, we'd like to ask our, our, our local actors now, I should say. They're, they're hubs, but they are doing great work at the local level. So we'd like to hear from you. And this is a question to all of uh, the, the, the hubs that are joining today. Two main challenges to achieving these goals in your own community. So please do share your insights with us um, and I will have to be the bad person here and remind you that unfortunately we'll have to keep every speaker to two minutes because we want to hear the most from you and let's use time efficiently. Two minutes each hub. Let's go Riyadh, Chandigarh, Rabat and Port Louis please. Hello, good uh, morning. It's a pleasure and honor to be with you here. Um, I think the world needs to celebrate first that these goals have been actually agreed. I think it was quite a remarkable end for 2015. Um, and uh, I know Davos is an economic forum, and I understand the tendency to think of businesses as vehicles to uh, ensure we meet the challenges. But frankly, I think community engagement and having people grassroots are able to engage with these goals. that things, learning opportunities like science centers, museums, and public program to bring awareness along grassroots because it will take two to tango. It will take policy, but it will take a lot of people on the ground to adapt personal uh, commitment to these goals as well. And this is what we do here in Mishkat Interactive Center for Atomic and Renewable Energy. We're offering a venue for young individuals in Saudi Arabia, teachers, and we reach underprivileged areas as well to appreciate the importance of sustainability and how individuals on the micro level are very important to ensure that the whole country actually um, achieve these goals. So um, to me, public engagement and channeling corporate CSR funds towards engaging the public will guarantee that you get future businessmen future research, researchers to actually do execute um, transforming before 2030 to that direction. That is Amr Almadani in Riyadh, Executive Director of Mishkat at King Abdullah City for Atomic and Renewable Energy. Thank you. Let's go to Venkat Maturi in, um, in, in Chandigarh, India, Senior Director of Strategy for JA Worldwide's India Enterprise Impact Initiative. Just wanted to remind the bios because it's important to know what work you're doing at the local level and what insights you're sharing. Please go ahead, Bankat. Good, mo good morning. Uh, I would put the entire concern about sustainability on two key aspects. One is credibility and other is commitment. On credibility, I think it's very important how do we articulate this whole problem? Because uh, what we see is uh, there seems to be a lack of comprehension as seen by the citizens who are the beneficiaries of any development effort that we might take. Uh, there seems to be a certain lack in the articulation that leaders that make uh, the leaders make in terms of the goals or the attainments, the targets, 
for those citizens. Uh, let me just explain. At, at the crux of sustainable development goals, what is it that we really wish to achieve? We wish to achieve certain parity in quality of life. But then, are we really willing to take the bait? If you look at the world economy today, it's a $75 trillion economy. And if I were to keep India in perspective, of the $75 trillion economy, which is the global economy, India is just $2 trillion. Now, a $2 trillion economy is funding 16% of the world's population. Now, if I need to achieve parity in quality of life, which is perhaps the highest abstraction of all the 17 SDGs, then effectively, I need to multiply the GDP of India by six times. Now, what it means is, is the world willing to let go wealth creation in favor of India? Because it's just not about attaining SDGs, because behind that economic shift, there also comes a shift in political control, job, turf control. So the whole point is, uh, while it is good to have SDGs, what citizens might be asking and are also asking is, is the world ready to let go of some of that control and allow wealth to move to those places where population is? I think this is a good summary of uh, the way the thoughts have been drifting around in this side of the world. Thank you, Venkat. And Sonia Mazur, UN Economic Commission for your Vice Chairman. Let's hear from you, Sonia. Thank you, Abdel. I think uh, the two challenges, major challenges on a global level um, in Africa, developing countries um, uh, particularly, is access to energy. We cannot go towards sustainable development if we don't have access to energy. And if you see the African continent, you have 800 million people that have exactly the same energy capacity as a country as Spain. So this is fundamental for sustainable development. Um, secondly, access to financing is something that is major. And you know, on the local level, there is, there is um, not uh, the capacity building to bring back um, projects that are bankable for the i -Fi. So access to financing access to financing for in um, in a typical government deficit today and the global economy is uh, is uh, is important to uh, to drain private sector finances and that's why PPPs public partners partnerships are going to to um, to play a major role in uh, in uh, bringing uh, fresh investment uh, to the world and public private uh, partnerships are something that are very complex. So we have to do this in a in a very in a very um, in a very um, um, uh, definite manner. In where we uh, we make sure that we have the right counseling, the right financial counseling, um, uh, technical counseling, and legal counseling. And you know, in Africa. Okay, um, we will be back with Sonia if we can um, figure out what went wrong with our Skype connection. But let's go to Tony Lee Luen Len in Port Louis, um, founding chairperson of the Green Building Council of Mauritius. Hi, thanks for having me here. Um, I think for me the, the, the challenge is um, regarding organization because I think throughout decades we know what we want, we know what to do. But actually, is how do we actually do it? Is the issue. So, I mean, the SDGs now uh, for me is broader than the MDGs. So we can all relate, and it, things can resonate to us. So it's actually how can we actually work together? The former speaker was talking about PPPs, which is a big private partnerships, and and then one of the panelists spoke about shared values and and businesses, that, you know, pushing the. Uh, the agenda of providing social goods, which is actually also good for business. But for me, I think the challenge is how actually all the different sectors of the system actually work together efficiently to deliver these goals. For me, the focus is about partnerships, about collaboration, is about how can we organize ourselves, you know, all the different sectors, public, private, and don't forget civil society. Um, one of the person talk about community engagement is how we can actually have all the players organize themselves, work together to deliver these goals is the key. Because 
uh, we know what to do, we've got money, uh, but actually it's how do we actually do this is the issue. Thank you so much, Tony Lee, Luen Len. Well, um, at this point, I, I, I wanted to take the opportunity to sort of wrap up what we've been talking about because now it seems like it's time to talk about solutions, but I don't even need to say anything because Tony, y y that was great. We all know what to do, but the question is how do we really achieve that? So that's why I'd like to turn to our, our, our panelists here and let's go in reverse order, Gonzalo Munez. How is it possible to mobilize local communities to, to explore solutions? Well, I'll be back. I'll, 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 I'll go back to, to the point that, that I was talking about. This type of new companies, most of them are totally aware of the global problems and looking for local <coughs> solutions. They do believe, as Tony mentioned, on the power of communities. They do understand how relevant it is to implement solutions that are talking to the people that are living uh, around, around the, the company. So uh, we, we definitely understand that uh, to, to really achieve the, the SDG, there is a huge opportunity for businesses. <coughs> And that's the thing that we understand that many of the traditional companies are not uh, really seen. And, and, and we believe that probably very soon in places like the World Economic Forum, you will be having uh, massive uh, groups of people and probably sessions around companies like the benefit corporations or B Corps or regenerative companies, collaborative businesses. So many new type of businesses. Here in the World Economic Forum, we have this uh, specific program about circular economy. That's another relevant issue, relevant topic that uh, business people can really tackle and use it as a business opportunity because that will allow us to, to really move forward very quickly. Uh, one of the problems is that we understand the problems, we understand uh, probably some of the solutions, we have them. <coughs> We're many times spending a lot of more money in creating the problem than solving it. Uh, but just like, like, like Venkat mentioned, uh, are we ready to, to really mo look, uh, move forward towards solving and, 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 and tackling the SDGs? I understand that there's a relevant and uh, an urgent role for businesses. And that means businesses ha ha has to be rede redefined. Mm -hmm. And um, William, what is your take on that, especially at the national level when it comes to um, communicating these goals and, and making sure actors are participating? Well, I want to support uh, Tony's point, actually, because the SDGs are obviously hugely ambitious, ending poverty, ending hunger, and uh, these problems are extraordinarily complex. They won't be solved without uh, a, a large partnership, multi-stakeholder partnerships involving government, involving business, uh, and involving communities and, and being led by those communities. So uh, we, we need those partnerships that Tony talked about to, to solve them. Uh, I think the public-private partnerships are very important and, and can be highly catalytic in seeding some of these uh, and proving some of the business cases to get businesses to come in. Uh, the theme of, of, uh, of uh, Davos this year is the fourth industrial revolution, and that is actually not some abstract concept only to be talked about in the mountains. It, it's happening around the world. I was quite recently in a remote part of Tanzania sitting with a smallholder farmer and she has her mobile phone. She can get paid for her crops on her phone. She has a savings account that earns interest on her phone. She can apply for a small loan with a text message and get an instant approval or not and have the money on her phone. So her ability to be resilient, to participate in this economy has grown exponentially through this technology and that's spreading everywhere very fast. Well, that's great because actually hearing human stories, um, that's when we can really relate to the change that's taking place on the ground. And that was that's why it was very helpful. And like you said, it's just not a debate among us. Uh, it's not even uh, just, you know, so it's, it's, it's about people. It's about changing um, people's lives and making an impact on the ground. Um, that's why that story was great. And at that point, I would like to go back to our um, cities again and ask you, um, what your solution is. Please give us your ideas as to how we could um, come up with a good idea. Well, I should say 
the best idea you think that would convince everybody that this is the way to go and this is the way to achieve these goals and would love to hear from you, um, especially what your, uh, what your experience has been um, given the work that you're doing at the local level and what your solutions are. Let's go to uh, Riyadh again. Amr al if you can hear us, would love to hear your perspective on this. Uh, thank you very much. Um, the goals are globally appealing. They can make sense uh, generally to everybody. But I think the worst thing we can start with is assume that a global solution that fits all communities. So I think the first approach to solving this is each community needs to adapt uh, an approach that is locally relevant. So taking that to account, I believe um, in our community here, it is very important that these that sometimes seem to be top down goals defined by, by uh, the international community is for the locals and public to engage with them. And I think that a lot of resolutions on personal level can help actually achieve prosperity in, in, in many of these. And we do work uh, in Mishkat Interactive Center with a lot of partnerships to make sure that we're empowering our young individuals to be lifelong learners. We do open a lot of opportunities to bridge the gap for women in science, encourage young girls to take on science careers, um, specific in the fields of uh, renewable uh, energy for the future. And I believe that is for a need we identify. Our unemployment for women is higher than uh, unemployment for men. And I think that for our context, engaging and empowering individuals is, is, is one of the uh, uh, important ways uh, to go. Now, no wonder technology will help. No wonder business partnerships will help. But unless you empower the individual, who will end up probably a decision maker in, in some of these um, um, uh, fronts. And I think public engagement increases the absorptive capacity of a nation to intellectually and powerfully engage with the SDGs. Thank you, um, Amr in Riyadh. Um, let's go to Venkat Maturi in Chandigarh, Sorry. India. Thank you. Uh, I believe in the first thing that we all need to do is fundamentally believe that it is possible to achieve this parity in living, uh, living standards. The solutions, I believe, could be broadly seen in two broad, you know, in kind of in two broad perspectives. One is solutions that create a common infrastructure, and those solutions which create a specific infrastructure. When I say common infrastructure, it could be public health, it could be sanitation, it could be whatever that you might have. And this is probably one space where the controversies or the, the, or the pushes and pulls may be slightly lesser. And it might also be possible to have some sort of inter-country contributions and those countries which have moved ahead in technologies, they could contribute to those technologies which are lagging, so on and so forth. But I think the real, the larger problem where the solutions may not be readily available would be the specific infrastructure. And let me explain to you what exactly would we mean by specific infrastructure. Now, there is something about creating wealth for the nation as a whole, but then, some of that wealth necessarily has to get translated and passed on to the individual because that's how their living standards might move up. And in, and in doing so, their other indices on health, etc., etc., might become better. Now, the point is, look at uh, an economy like a US today, which is clocking $17 trillion, and it has a workforce of, it has a population of just about 300 million. Now, if, how, do I, how does the situation become complicated, let's say, if I have to look at India? I'm $2 trillion. And I have a workforce of 400 million. Much as I may like to build into entrepreneurship initiatives or create those kind of mechanisms in India, do we believe that the next incremental $10 trillion addition to India, even if that might happen, is going to create another 400 million jobs? And that's a big question mark. And that's why we do not know. Do we have solutions which can create those specific infrastructure, which can translate wealth and put it in the pockets of the individuals? I think that's a big question mark. Thank you. Thank you, Venkat. Um, and l let's go to Sonia, Sonia Mazur. And Sonia, you have one more minute because we lost you in the previous round. It can create a specific infrastructure, it can translate wealth and put it in. And that's a big question. Thank you. Thank you, Venkat. Um, and l let's go to Sonia, Sonia Mazur. 
Okay, there's a bit of lag, but that's okay. This is live anyway, so this happens. Um, Sonia, Thank you so much. We have a lot of technical problems here, so I'm happy I have one minute more. We can hear one you fine. More. Go ahead. So I think, Asin, the baseline is important. Uh, all the countries have uh, not the same baseline coming, uh, you know, addressing addressing the sustainable development goals. And we, when we see, for example, for Millennium Development Goals, Morocco has done a tremendous work in reforms, economical reforms, in terms of political reforms, in terms of governance. And we have achieved the Millennium Development Goals by the end of 2015, most of them. And we have eradicated poverty, going to sustainable development in, 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 uh, uh, our, for our environmental issues. So it's, it's the baseline that is important because all the countries have no access to the financing uh, and tax payment as everyone. For example, if you see Burundi, a tax payment in Burundi is $35 per year and uh, it won't go uh, towards millennium development goals or sustainable development goals now as a country like Morocco that has done a lot and major uh, things uh, in the last 15 years. So uh, the baseline is important. Uh, something else is uh, we have to make sure that um, we have to make sure that um, uh, women are empowered. Uh, and uh, here in Morocco, we have uh, uh, done some uh, major achievement in having women in parliament, having women in the, uh, in the uh, local communities and working and access to primary ed education for girls. So uh, for us, uh, for us, sustainable development goals is something we can achieve in the next 15 years. And we have done here in Morocco something that is called Jihad Inou. That's, a, that's a, a territorial approach where we uh, accompany local communities in their sustainable energy development. So in public awareness, capacity building, matching offer and demand in terms of investment, and that has uh, brought uh, tremendous results in terms of uh, encouraging local communities to take their future in their own hands and go towards sustainable energy development. And we have done this uh, with three uh, local communities and uh, uh, with the help of international cooperation. And we want to make sure that this is duplicated around the country. Um, and we uh, have also created the Demena Energy Award. This is going to label the communities on the, on the local level in Morocco, but also in the Mena region. And uh, we, with this help, we're going to be able to compare um, a local community, a local commune municipality in Morocco with one of the 1,500 communities uh, in Europe. So we will be able to bring uh, fresh Fresh, uh, fresh money and, 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 and the private sector and FDIs going to be, uh, uh, to be, uh, to be coming and investing in, in, uh, in building, in infrastructure, in agriculture, in street lightning and so on. And uh, this, is, this is major for us. Sonia, actually, I'd like to take the opportunity to ask you a question that I'm quite curious about. Uh, so in order to achieve these goals... Sorry, I lost you. Uh, can, can you hear me now? Um, so, the yes. question, the, so the question is this. Um, achieving these goals, yes, it is, a, it is um, what we are striving for globally. However, um, I'm curious as um, what your perspective is, because the, do, do, does cultural difference, do cultural differences make it more difficult to attain these goals in different parts of the world? Because you're talking about um, projects that are they're, they're women in education. I was wondering if you think whether um, cultural differences uh, could be uh, turned into an advantage and in what way. So I was curious what your take on that is. Since you're joining us from um, Rabat, uh, you have a, you have a I'm, I'm sure you have um, an interesting perspective on this as well. Thank you, Thank you Absin. 
I think co a cultural aspect is, is something that is, that, is, uh, that is relevant for bringing sustainable development in countries, of course. And I think Morocco is playing a role model in the region in terms of enforcing uh, democracy and enforcing a, a anti-corruption uh, governance in the political framework, in the economical framework and social. And today you see women empowered and girls empowered that can have the ability to be in parliament to foster their their uh, their own uh, future uh, talk about their 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 problems and bring forward um, uh, civil society work uh, to make sure that we develop our own our own um, environment and we have a, a major role in uh, in uh, in uh, in, uh, in uh, bringing sustainable energy development because as you know women are the first one to be to be touched by climate change and to be touched by poverty and to be touched also by energy access. So these, our women are the ones that go and, and make sure that their family have access to water, have access to energy and have access to food. And I think Morocco has played this major role in achieving the Millennium Development Goals beforehand, before most of them have been achieved before 2015. So I'm sure and I'm committed uh, that uh, that uh, will be uh, will go forward in uh, in in um, in going towards sustainable development on goals and and see in, in fighting climate change, Morocco and mitigation action. We have a we're building the the biggest solar. Uh, plant in the world, 500 megawatt in Warzazet, and this is going to bring a lot of social impact in the community, in the south, southern region, southern province, in Morocco. And, and moreover, uh, in the COP21, Our Majesty the King has brought forward the concept of we're not going to have capa electrical capacity by 42%. Uh, in by 2020, but we're going to go beyond that and go towards 52% by 2030. Yeah. And this is a major commitment, excuse me, for, for a country that doesn't pollute a lot and doesn't consume a lot of electricity. Thank, and yes, is, um, has a fruit in Thank you, Sonia. Thank you, Sonia. That was, that, that was really helpful. I'd like to move to Port Louis. Um, Tony Lee, your, your take, and then I'll come back to our panelists with, because we also have questions. Uh, uh, our hashtag again, shaping sustainability. We'll also um, look at those questions. But Port Louis first. Brings back to the challenge that um, I brought up earlier about these how do you actually work together. So um, the idea will be uh, obviously there's been a, a campaign that has been launched by the Port We Hub is Adobe Gold, a gold, which is basically you know lots of things happening around the world. People make pledges, make commitments, etc. So is and then use ICT to connect these different groups together. But I think for Mauritius, what's important is, is for us to have a legislative framework, how we actually can work together, a legislative or even practical framework, how to we work together, because we understand that each sector got its own agenda, you know, the private sector will have to make money, etc. is how do we create a common vision around the sustainable development goals and how we can get whatever we need out of it, if I'm a private sector, which means money, or if I'm, uh, you know, political and uh, public sector, it's sort of thing. So, so we, we, we must understand that we're all in there for different different things, but at the end of the day, that we have a clear common vision. So, and, and for me, the, the, the crux of it is how to actually organize ourselves, uh, work together and find some framework, practical framework, legislative framework to be able to, to deliver. Thank you, Tony. So a question from OECD on development um, with our hashtag shaping sustainability. They ask, how can we engage the public, specifically young individuals, in SDGs implementation? Willem, let's start with you first and then with Gonzalo. Well, uh, you're taking questions here from social media. I think you're uh, perhaps answering your own question. I think uh, the young in particular, I'm the father of a 14-year-old, and uh, she's uh, constantly engaged uh, <laughs> online. So I think that provides a great channel and an ability to really 
uh, bring to life these issues, to humanize these issues, to connect people directly uh, north-south uh, and in a very vivid way that goes well beyond the sort of boring statistics that one talks so much about here in Davos. That's great. And Gonzalo, your take, cool. your answer to yeah. OECD on development. Yeah, definitely. I think that, uh, and, and taking at the same time part of the, the rest of the panelists mentioned, I think that we, from the private sector, have to be very close to community. And that means also uh, being able to uh, work close to the needs, the real needs of the consumers, top uh, in, in, uh, identifying our role from the business sector as trying to invent invent new products and invent new solu new needs. And instead of that, we have to uh, move forward towards solving problems from the business sector. So giving the people what they need in a transparent way, using uh, social media and using marketing in a way that it can be very transparent and very uh, uh, relevant, the impact that we are creating. So I think that uh, the way to, to move forward is totally related to transparency. Thank you. Another question um, that I see here on Twitter, Kumar Manish asks us, um, we've moved from MDGs, Millennium Development Goals, to 17 um, Sustainable Development Goals, but issues have remained the same as government, private, and people differ, different, I guess. How to bridge it? How to bridge it is the question. Venkat, let's ask you how to bridge it. We had this panel, dis when we had this panel discussion in Chandigarh, 50% uh, of our audience was actually st school students. And um, uh, I couldn't have appreciated this disconnect more. Uh, this, the youngsters probably do not share the same articulation or the urgency as the leadership around the world have defined uh, the manner in which they have defined SDGs. Now, uh, we, we definitely need to get some traction over here. Definitely the constituents who are responsible around achieving these goals need to come together. What has come out very strongly during those discussions is we need honest and sincere leadership. We need leadership who has their ears to the ground. You have to necessarily start communicating in a language and in a sequence of priorities that is relatable by those stakeholders. If it's a top-down approach, we might lose them. Thank you, Venkat. Same question to Amr al Madani in Riyadh. How is it possible to bridge this? Can, can Amr hear us at the moment? Again, I'm a, I'm a firm uh, believer that um, engagement of uh, youth uh, and the public is important. And I think everybody realizes that um, corporate social responsibilities actually now are able to contribute bottom line to companies by positioning them as you know best responsible suppliers of goods or services and a lot of these SDGs actually relate to most of the businesses that exist in the world so I think that one way to bridge the gap is for the business community to channel a lot of their CSR activities um, into empowerment of the, uh, the public and youth to engage with the SDGs and hence um, sustainable utilization of CSR funds. Thank you. Tony Lee Luen Len in Port Louis. Yeah, I didn't really understand uh, the, the question, um, but what I'll get from the answers of um, the panelists here, um, yeah, I totally agree with like, community engagement about creating awareness um, and, and then also for businesses to, to maybe uh, relook at their mission. Um, a lot of multinationals also have, have relooked at their mission to, to, to be uh, broader. And I think with the new SDGs also, uh, it's, it's broader and everyone can actually, can, things can resonate with uh, a lot of people compared to the MDGs. And I think, uh, um, you know, people can see um, and work towards some objectives and it's, it's easier to, to, to understand. Sonia Mazur in Rabat. Uh, Sonia, can you hear us? Let me check with our tech team here. I, okay, w one more time. Sonia, can you hear us? All right, never mind. Technology age, sometimes it makes your life difficult, but um, it, I think she's responding was not to have all stakeholders 
at uh, around the table. And uh, I think what we have to achieve for sustainable development goals is to make sure that all stakeholders, civil society, women, uh, private sector, institutional, on the global and local level, are, are committed and are aware, first of all, are aware of what's happening, what's expected from them, where it's gonna happen, why it's gonna happen, and the baseline, where they go from and where they wanna, they wanna go. Because today we have citizens that, uh, that are, uh, are aware of their own future. They wanna know what's going on. They don't want glo global policies to be applied to all of them. They want everything to be localized localized on a subnational level and to uh, by the local municipalities and that's very important for 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 them to be part of uh, uh, of the change Sonia thank you um, so this gives us a great idea about what kind of challenges lie ahead but what we could possibly all do at the individual level which brings us to the last part of this debate and at that part we turn to our uh, our cities, our hubs, and have you um, ask our panelists here what your questions are and what you think are the most um, pressing questions, I should say, in terms of achieving um, these goals. I guess we could go in this order. Riyadh and uh, Chandigarh and Rabat and Port Louis. Well, Davos, uh, having uh, being a platform for global business communities, um, the question is, what would Davos be doing in order to bring um, enthusiasm amongst businesses to focus a lot of their CSR activities in youth and public engagement with the SDGs? And I think it would be great to see some Davos studies about best practices for corporate CSR uh, funds and how they can support SDGs so all countries can learn from that. Thank you, Amr. Um, let's go to Chandigarh. Venkat, your question. Certainly. Uh, to some extent, institutions such as, such as TechnoServe or Tricyclos uh, definitely show us a way and we can get traction and clear off some amount of the gaps through entrepreneurship routes or such things. But I believe the, the greater question or the query or, the, or rather the open open statement over here is eventually uh, is the world leadership willing to let go we know the world has a particular momentum we also believe by far the best economic growth model that the world has is the market model but to a certain extent the market model has its own limitations we also believe SDGs have the right intent for the global population but the whole point is are we willing is the world leadership willing to let go some of those ways which which the market model restricts uh, to ensure that the wealth generation is more inclusive what can be done by davos to make sure this shift in thought process happens in global leadership that's the question thank you van Kott. um let's actually go to port louis as well and then have all these three questions because we don't we unfortunately sonia is not with us because of a tech problem um Sonia yeah. is back. All right. Well, okay. Then yeah, I'm back. But all I'm right. All right, everything. Sonia. That's great. Okay. Then I'm I will have you and and Tony wait a little bit because I'd like to turn to our panelists to get their answers, and then we'll come to you and have your questions, um, and then we'll then we'll proceed. Please go ahead, um, Gonzalo first, and then we'll. Well, um, <clears throat> what what we can see from Davos' perspective is that. Uh, at least what, what I can see is that we're living a moment, a moment of shift. Uh, there have been relevant questions being done only in the last few years uh, regarding not only uh, sustainability from a CSR point of view, but relevantly from a business point of view. Uh, and that's totally related to this, uh, the SDGs. Uh, I think that what we'll see in the future is that we will be having much more uh, businesses that are uh, using the ESDGs as the opportunity to run businesses. So uh, as, as we've been seeing from the B Corp movement, we have thousands of companies and each of them are, are relevantly uh, achieving or helping achieve some of those goals. And I think that now going to uh, Venkat's uh, question, I think there's no way not to do so. 
There's no way for businesses not to do some kind of sacrifice to really achieve the SDGs. And that's a hard point. I mean, that's like the elephant in the room. Nobody wants to do those sacrifices. But it's obvious that also the, the, all the business people and probably all of us as consumers, we must be doing some sacrifices, not only to achieve those, uh, those goals now, but also considering that we are 7.3 uh, billion people in this world and we know that there's a maximum capacity for the world, we're, we're facing a moment of relevant change and that change is totally related on how we live in this, in this world, how do we make businesses, and how do we create all those partnerships that Tony was talking about, and how do we understand the local implementation uh, regarding the baselines that Sonia mentioned. So, so I think we have enough data, enough information. Uh, my, my question will be, are we willing to do those sacrifices now? And which type of uh, attitude we need to do so. And that means empathy. We're, we're having lack of empathy from the business sector, probably from the public sector as well. And at the same time, I really believe we are not using our supposed intelligence in the right way. So we will need to be developing a new way of intelligence, business intelligence. And that will be within also enough courage to tackle all those goals. Thank you, Gonzalo. Your Just two quick uh, comments to these very good questions. I think Venkat has spoken more than once about the, the problem of income inequality, and I just want to, to say that that's very much on the agenda uh, here in Davos. Uh, there's a lot of talk about it, and I think an understanding from business and civil society how unhealthy this is, uh, both within and across countries. So it's firmly on the agenda. Uh, the other thing uh, I would add is that civil society is extraordinarily well represented here. Uh, credit the World Economic Forum of bringing people together. So I've been in multiple sessions where the CEO of a major multinational is sitting next to a minister or a head of state who's sitting next to a leader of a human rights NGO or an NGO dedicated to getting uh, child labor uh, into history. And so there's an ability to exchange and share ideas and uh, think about practical solutions, which has uh, been very impressive here. May, may I add something Absolutely. to what Go William ahead, said? Yes, uh, that's right. The, the role uh, of, for example, the Schwab Foundation in the Davos meetings is amazing. The people from like the social entrepreneurs, I'm a social entrepreneur, new social entrepreneur, 2015, but also young global leaders uh, are, are really, really uh, having a relevant role uh, in, the, in the Davos meeting. And also I can see, uh, and, I'm, and, I, and I work with the circular economy program, and that's taking a very, very relevant role in the discussions. So I can see this uh, as a very relevant topic. Let's go to Port Louis and then to Rabat, your questions to our panelists. 30 seconds each, please. Sorry, my mic. Um, we can hear you fine. Go ahead, Tony. Okay. So the, for me, the question is: um, We understand in the conference you have people which you know think like you know the same way and have got the vision. But most of the businesses, uh, um, like in Mauritius, uh, if we speak to them about shared values, um, you know, 99% won't understand what it is. So how, how can you actually accelerate to permeate these ideas of circular economies, B Corp, shared values, etc., to you know a developing country like ours, uh, where businesses are just business as usual? So you know, it's hard you get from the high level thinking, you know, let's say circular economy, B Corp, etc., to just how quick we can get it down to the ground, say in a developing country, where where you know, for for them all these these um, understanding is not there and the awareness. That's quite a tough question, Tony. Let's see what Sonia has in mind. Sonia in her butt. What is your question to our panelists? Thank you. Um, my question is, now that governments on a, on a, on a national level uh, know exactly how to go for sustainability for this world, how the civil society and the, 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 the corporates, corporates and the private sector and every man and woman in this world, 
what kind of roadmap do they have to apply the sustainable development goals in their daily life? And I think Carlos said something very important, is we cannot be sustainable if there is no compassion in every one of us. And compassion is major, and we have to be more compassionate to what, to, to, toward one another. And I think that's the main pillar for sustainability in our world. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you, Sonia. And back to our panelists in reverse order, William first and then Gonzalo. Well, Tony uh, asks a very uh, challenging and important question, and Indeed. I want to I validate the, uh, the premise that I think the idea of shared value, the idea that companies find where the business interests and the social interests align is much more uh, widespread uh, among larger uh, multinationals than it is in many local companies. I, I'm optimistic, though, that uh, these practices will be adopted. Uh, in the first instance, because of the facility of communication and the ability for people to hear about and see things going on across the world and in, in, in forums like these, but also for the fundamental reason that this is increasingly being adopted because it's good business. It's not a separate charitable uh, idea, but it is actually central to the core business. And so in that sense, uh, I'm quite optimistic that as these companies see this and understand it, uh, they also adopt it more. Well, um, Tony, I appreciate a lot the, the point of view. Uh, I, I would say that uh, this is accelerating, but my question would be, are we going to get to the point in the, in the right time or is it too slow? But it's, it is accelerating. I was 10 years ago, a CEO of a traditional company right in Chile. No, no knowledge about all of this. And I can see in the last seven years how this is, has been growing. And from our perspective, uh, that acceleration uh, happens mainly with three ways. One is leadership. And we can see companies like Unilever or Danone or Campbell's or many, many big companies saying, okay, that's the way to move forward. We know that business as usual is not a solution. We need to find a new path. And, uh, and they are really leading this movement and, and, and they will hopefully help us to make that mainstream. The other, the other point, uh, Sonia mentioned it, is finance. Uh, and, and we ha must uh, see in the next years uh, financial sector really, really internal internalizing the externalities of their investments. And, uh, and therefore, the, the, the impact financing sector, uh, as it is growing, it should grow faster than, than the way it's going. And the other way uh, to accelerate it is legal stuff. Uh, uh, Movements like the B Corp are already legal in uh, 30, 32 states from the, U from the United States. Uh, now there's a benefit uh, law in Italy. There are many, many countries in the world working either to have a benefit corporation uh, structure or a social business structure because they know that's a way to move forward. So finally what happens is that it's not one single thing, it's the movement as a whole. When you can see a lot of business leaders and a lot of financial leaders, a lot of po politicians talking about this. We have now the New York City uh, Best for the World campaign. Same thing happening in Rio. So also mayors are taking the lead. Fortune, the, the magazine, mentioned the B Corp as one of the five trends to be followed this year. So uh, from our perspective, we see that acceleration happening. Our, our, our question will be, is it, is it enough? or shall, shall we accelerate it much more? Is it enough? Shall we accelerate it much more? We'll have to leave it, we'll leave it there. We ran out of time, but with those two big questions, I'm sure um, our, our audience here and, uh, and, and our online audience um, who joined this conversation using our hashtag, uh, Shaping Sustainability, I'm sure they'll have a lot to think about. Thank you so much uh, for being here and for joining this conversation online. And um, our speakers, once again, Gonzalo Munez, um, co-founder and chief executive officer of Triciclos in Brazil and Willem Warshower, President and Chief Executive Officer of TechnoServe. Thank you for being here, our Davos panelists and our hubs, Amr Almadani in Riyadh, Sonia Mazur in Rabat, um, Vankat Maturi in Chandigarh, and Tony Lee Luan Len in Port Louis. Thank you so much for joining and, and sharing us your insights. Thanks, we'll leave it here, and um, do join other really stimulating conversations that will be taking place after this one. Thanks again. Thanks.